Okay, great. Okay. All right. Well, welcome back. Thank you for hanging in there with us, and we're going to have another stimulating hour of talking about fetal alcohol syndrome. I uh, just want to let you know that OMAC and Colville, hi, out there, folks. I was just out there uh, in the last month, and you guys are in the lead. You have eight people apiece watching, so uh, we're going to give the other people who haven't called in yet a chance to catch up. All right. Yay, attendance. <laughs> Julie, who, who haven't we heard from? Okay, um, just, again, a brief um, housekeeping um, item here. For those of you at the satellite sites, if you have not called in with your attendance rosters, if you could do that, please. Um, we haven't heard yet from, I believe, Forks and Goldenrod, Kelso, Long Beach, um, and Chehalis, if you all could call in. And then there's a few now that um, should be calling in on the time frame that I had given you earlier. So um, shortly, hopefully, we'll hear from New Ma uh, Newport, Olympia, and then Pasco, Port Angeles, and Had Port Hadlock. And also, for those of you who are on um, your home computers and watching us via the, the webcast, if you could also email us <coughs> and just let us know that you are um, online with us and watching us, and we can make sure that you get credit for being here. Right. And so. I guess we have someone from Long Beach. Great. Hello. Hello. Yes, Welcome. I was wondering if we were going to get to what we can do as foster parents at, with alcohol fetal syndrome coming in, into when our home. Uh, when you're talking about behaviors? Right. Yeah, well, how we're going to start this hour is we're going to talk more about the diagnosis of the central nervous system damage. And then we're going to obviously, with that, be getting into behaviors and so forth. And then next week, Julie is really going to take the lead and spend pretty much the entire time talking specifically about that, about how are we uh, raising our children in the home. And we really do encourage you to call in with specific questions, especially next week, because, again, no two children are affected the same. So if you ask general questions, about FAS and you have specific things in mind, my answers might not fit your situation. Okay. okay. And that, that will Thank be you. next week, um, right. almost the entire have, three hours. Okay, um, go ahead. Some of the children we are seeing are very large. They aren't small, but they also have most of the facial features. Yeah, again, you know, the, the things we're looking for for the full-blown syndrome are what we've been talking about. Then we're going to be starting to talk about related conditions, which is a situation where you might have a child who has maybe some of the facial characteristics, but not all of them, not enough to get the full diagnosis. They may have some facial features and hardly any of the growth deficiency, or they may have some growth deficiency, but not much of the facial features. And essentially, your problem, though, is going to be uh, coming out through the central nervous system damage. And again, these physical features can come and go. And, I mean, at the clinic, we will, I mean, if a child comes in and they have all of the classic facial features of fetal alcohol syndrome and also um, on uh, refutable evidence of central nervous system damage and we know that there was adequate alcohol exposure um, to, <clears throat> to cause those central nervous system issues, even if that child is not growth deficient, especially if we know that the growth deficiency may have been affected because mom quit drinking during that last trimester, really slowed down, went into treatment, whatever. Um, it doesn't mean that that child will not get a diagnosis of what they'll probably get is a diagnosis of atypical fetal alcohol syndrome. And what the atypical means is that basically the, the growth deficiency just is not there, but everything else is. All right, thank you. You're welcome. And you know, it just it reminds me of a, a young man that uh, was very small when he was adopted. As a matter of fact, his foster mother told me that she put layers of clothes on him so the neighbors wouldn't think she was starving him because he was just so tiny. Well, he is now in his 20s and he's six feet tall and weighs 185 pounds. And even though he had all the classical physical features, including the facial features, uh, he now has pretty much normalized in his looks. But even with an IQ of 107, continues to have problems. And I know as a teenager, he was in every detention center in the state of Washington, as I recall. Uh, and uh, we'll, t but we'll talk more about the behaviors and so forth. So thank you for your call. Anybody else out there? 
Okay. okay. Well, now we're going to, did you want Remember to Remember our scenario, though. So if oh, you all were yes. thinking about that scenario over your break and you want to venture um, an answer as to whether or not that mom could give birth to a child with full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome, please call us at our number, 1-800-407-9487, and just give us your um, opinion as to whether or not that child could have fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, come on, OMAC and Colville. I talked to you about this. <laughs> and Carla and Patricia, you know, I know you guys are out there, some of my co-trainers. So um, you've heard us talk. You venture some guesses here. Please. That's right. And we will. We are going to hold the answer to that little riddle uh, for 15 or 20 minutes and give you a chance to call in or email. So let's talk about central nervous system damage. Let's look at the slide that we use in clinic to determine central nervous system dysfunction. Now, in that four-digit Likert scale where we have to make this decision whether or not to give the rating of a one, two, three, or four, one being no problems, four being extreme problems, it's real easy to give the one and the four. The one, obviously, we see absolutely no signs of brain damage through behavior or anything else. Four is also relatively easy because to get a four, you have to have microcephaly, meaning you have to have a small head. When you have a small head, you have a small brain. That tells us there is organic brain damage. Uh, an MRI, something that a brain image that we can actually see the holes, will also get you a four. However, much of the damage to the brain is very subtle, and even an MRI would not show it. Uh, IQs below 60s, seizures. Is there anything I've missed? No, basically what Ka Carolyn is talking about now are hard neurological signs. Right. They are things that you can see either with the naked eye or um, that would be readily visible on a like a CAT scan or an MRI. All right, so if you go back to that slide again, where we have trouble is looking at the twos and threes. And, you know, the team at the University of Washington has trained teams around the state, so there are seven diagnostic clinics in the state. And we met for the first time as a group and spent at least half of the time together going over what is the difference between scoring someone a two or a three. Uh, we have to rely on observation of behavior and specific kinds of behavioral testing to figure that out. What we do in clinic, if there is a question, if we get to the point, well, I think he's a three minus or a two plus, we will grade down. We'll say he's a two, and then as the child uh, gets older, as there's more brain development and more, more behavior, we might have them come back in or have the parents report back to us. And if we do see an increase in uh, uh, signs of more central nervous system damage, they can be re-diagnosed and given that three. Okay, let's see the next slide. Uh, you know, th this is the graphic part of the talk, and I remember going into a high school once to give a lecture, and one of the kids said, oh, you're not going to show us any awful pictures like they do in driver's ed, and I said, ah, no, maybe one or two, <laughs> and at the end when they did the evaluation, this is what they talked about the most. Oh, my God, the brain slides. Because, you know, people sometimes say alcohol doesn't really do that much harm. What can a little alcohol do? Well, uh, alcohol can do a lot of things. Obviously, the brain on the left did not see a little alcohol. That child saw a lot of alcohol uh, during the pregnancy. Both of these children were full-term, nine-month pregnancies. The brains should be the same size. The child on the right died of uh, heart I, cardiac, cardiac, condition. cardiac condition after birth. There was no exposure to alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, or anything else. The other child died from the complications of being exposed to a tremendous amount of alcohol during the pregnancy. If you look at the next slide, that's a cross-section of that, that uh, healthy brain, and keep in mind that little uh, measurement to the, in the top left-hand corner. And you'll see there that the brain looks pretty much the same on the left and the right side. There's good division. It's very important that the brain has a division because you need to have that there for left-right brain interaction. If you're into brains, the coloring is very good. There's lots of indentation, lots of mass, lots of place to store um, uh, neurons and dendrites and so forth. Now, the next slide is no one that you will see walking on the planet, and it actually shocked me to realize that this child actually lived for 10 days. But when people say alcohol can't really cause damage, I want you really to keep this slide in mind because this is what alcohol can do. Alcohol causes structural changes in the brain. That's what it does. Absolutely. And, you know, brain damage is what brings people to the clinic. I mean, it's not that necessarily that their children are tiny or that they have small, you know, palpebral fissures. Right. And it's the same for, you know, 
the reason my kids have IEPs at school or right. are on behavioral right. plans. Right. It's because their brains are structurally different. And, you know, oftentimes we hear parents and they say, well, oh my gosh, my child may be a serial, you know, murderer or an axe murderer or something else. Alcohol, you know, does not cause kids to be angry and it does not cause children to, um, to commit murder or be sexual predators, but alcohol changes the structure of the brain. And when the brain structure is different, these children are going to think differently and they're going to process information differently and they learn differently. Right. And that's what we need to remember. And again, thinking about how much alcohol can be safe. Again, Dr. Clarence says, you know, the gospel according to Sterling, Sterling. is what we say. <laughs> but, you know, three ounces of alcohol, three beers, three glasses of wine, three shots of whiskey, three wine coolers in one week can possibly cause some kind of damage to a fetus. Now, if this was a glass of wine and I drank it, I'm a fairly large person, although I'm sure TV is putting on at least 50 pounds. Just so you know that, <laughs> both of us. Both yes, of us, yes. yes. But, you know, this, uh, this drink in me is not going to cause me a lot of trouble. But if you think about a 14-week-old fetus, which is about this big, and think about that, you know, I always say, would you, if you could, remove the fetus from the womb and place it in a glass of wine while you drank one? It's really Russian roulette. Why play? No alcohol. What does this mean, especially when women don't know they're pregnant for the first few months? Plan pregnancies or use protection. Okay, now we've gone through all of the uh, diagnostics here, and let's see in the next slide what, if you went to clinic, you would come out with after having looked at growth, looked at the brain, looked at the face. And this is an example, I'm, uh, you can't read this, but it's an example of what would be the explanation of one of the categories that might come up from that 256 possible combinations of, of uh, uh, the things that we talked about. When you leave our clinic, you will have about two or three pages of handwritten notes with um, resources and, eval and the results of the evaluations. But then within about a month or so, you will get an actual seven or eight page typewritten report that will look like that cover sheet that you just saw on the slide. And it will go into way more depth about what um, everybody on the team found and what their recommendations were. And you know, it, in all the research we've done over the 10 years or so that the clinic has been going on, we have found that all the parents pretty much say, you know, I would, I would recommend for any family to do this, even parents who didn't find that it helped that much. And, and frankly, the saddest parents, the most troubled parents, are the ones who leave without the diagnosis. And they're sure they have found finally the thing that has caused their right. child and them all the problems, and then that's not the problem. Uh, but it is very important to diagnose. The children, believe it or not, will say, gee, I knew I wasn't stupid. I just didn't get it. I didn't know what was going on. And the, and the birth mothers will call me and say, you know, you're not going to believe this, but my child is trying to make me feel better. They are trying to make me uh, feel that it wasn't my fault in telling me that, they are, that I was alcoholic, I didn't know any better, I didn't know I was pregnant, whatever. I mean, truly, you are fortunate to have a child in your home, really, that has this disability and that they just bring so much beauty and grace to our lives. I mean, Julie will talk quite a bit about that next week. So let's see a slide of one of the, he, this was the first young man that was diagnosed in the Seattle area, I believe by Dr. Ann Streisguth, and he is now, I think, in his 30s. He has full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome. He, unlike many of our children with FAS, does have the IQ below 70. And if you think about it, this is the leading cause of mental retardation in the Western world. Yet most of our children affected by this do not have IQs in that mental retarded range. So, so you can just imagine how many people are truly affected. So you can see he's very small in stature, and I understand that even now in his 30s, he is still that tiny. He is, and he still lives in this area, and uh, <clears throat> lives, he's actually been quite successful in his life, I think. You know, I mean, he hasn't been involved in the justice system. Um, he lives with his adoptive mom, and he um, completed school and works in a sheltered workshop and all of that. But the biggest concern actually right now is his um, mom is now in her 70s. And a lot of people who know him and know his family um, are concerned about what will happen to him 
-hmm. when his mom isn't either able to take care of him anymore or she passes away because our children with fetal alcohol syndrome are going to need cradle to grave services. Absolutely. And you know, if you remember this, the slide with the four pictures of the little girl starting at four months of age, she's now also in her 30s and is in the same situation. Her life has been good. She's been successful for the disabilities that she's had to deal with, but it's because she has had an incredibly good home to live in. She also has an older adopted mom. We are worried what is going to happen to our children. Dr. Streisguth, when she came out with her disability, secondary disability report, looking at people with FAS over their lifetime in 1996, and she's still continuing the study, uh, found that the common outcomes for adults with fetal alcohol syndrome are incarceration, homelessness, and I think higher rates of suicide. These are not good outcomes for our children. Cradle to grave, it takes, it's a tired message, but it takes a village to raise our children, and we need all the help we can get foster parents ask for that extra help ask for respite bring respite to your home we'll talk more about this when we talk about interventions don't uh, have the children leave the home because it's usually more work getting everybody back <laughs> on schedule and in their structured life and you don't get that much rest but you do have to advocate for these children and yourself you do need That's more right. rest but you need more money for medical therapy. Uh, there's going to be many trips, as Julie will talk about, to school, talking about IEPs, probably, so forth and so and on. And doctor's visits. And, and doctor's that. visits. Well, we've been talking specifically about FAS, and we're going to move and make this broader and include what has been called many things, FAE, fetal alcohol effects, ARND, alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, fetal alcohol-related conditions, on and on and on and on. Uh, what, what it has in common with FAS is the brain damage, and truly FAS is just the tip of the iceberg because so many more people have the brain damage than are exhibiting the physical features. And we wonder, we look back and think about all the labels we've put on people over the years, uh, sociopathic, et cetera, et cetera, and even the labels now that our children are being Oppositional tagged with. defiant uh, and disorder ADD and, and reactive attachment disorder. All of this. And, all of those and just wonder yes. how much is it uh, really? Really, how much is the responsibility of alcohol? And we will never know that, truly. We won't. Uh, it's really hard to figure out exactly which behavior we can relate to which drink. It's also the fact that we have to look now at the new brain research, which is showing us how important nurturing is, how important those first few years after birth are, and proper nutrition and attention, eye contact, all those kinds of things. But FAS indeed is just the tip of the iceberg, and especially when we think about our teenagers who outgrow the physical features. In the next slide is a teenager who, look at her, beautiful. Gorgeous. She was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome, a sweet girl, and has had many problems. I believe she was even in a gang at one point. Her mother would say, oh, my gosh, you can't believe some of the people she brings home. And I asked her once, if you saw a fellow dressed in a tuxedo and well-kept and groomed and then saw somebody in ragged clothes who smelled like alcohol and urine, who would you speak to first? And, of course, she said, oh, it doesn't matter. All people are the same. Well, that's a beautiful thought. Right. But in reality, it can cause problems. I remember another story her mother told me is that she made it through high school, I think special ed, but she graduated. She got a driver's license. And she has a lot of memory deficit. One night she was going to the store to buy something. She took her purse, she took her driver's license, she got in the car and took off and became disoriented, did not remember where she was going or why she was going somewhere. She saw a freeway entrance sign and that was familiar to her. She got on the freeway. She lives in Kirkland. Two, three hours later, a phone call to frantic mother. Mom, what's Mount Vernon? She had run out of gas in Mount Vernon, so they had to go up and get her, bring the car back, and then they made sure that she left the house with money, she left the house with a full tank of gas, she left the house with directions, a list, all the things that would help her, the structure we need to provide. However, what do you think might happen if she had a flat tire and a car full of drunk fellows pulled over to help? Well, she would get in the car, no problem. Well, fortunately, she is now... Uh, married, married and happy and someone this person she's married to understands her needs loves her cherishes her and she is doing uh, well yes I think. she is okay the next slide 
excuse me. The next slide is something I sort of alluded to when I talked about the fact that you can't really decide whether or not alcohol is responsible for a particular behavior or all behaviors. It does have a subtle effect on the entire brain. It can, it can affect any part of the brain. So when we look at behaviors, and, and it's particularly distractible behaviors, and we know mom drank. She said, absolutely, I drank a great deal every day with the child. The child is diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome. We see it in the, in the face and the growth, and we uh, find it in the central nervous system testing. We also then find out that mom also consumed cocaine, which is another teratogen. A teratogen is something that damages the fetus. We find out maybe that dad had a genetic uh, learning disability. We find out that the mom was exposed to some toxin in the environment. She was punched in the stomach during pregnancy or fell down the stairs. How do we know which of those um, uh, you know, factors contributed to this, this behavior we're seeing? Well, we don't. We don't. But alcohol is in the mix. And I have to say that, that Dr. Claren will not allow me uh, usually to use this, but it was so good. In clinic one day, he talked about the stew. And the behavior is the stew and alcohol, are, maybe it's the potatoes and genetic factors are the onions, and environmental issues are the carrots and so forth. I mean, it, you know, it is in, it's in the mix, and it's very hard to tease out what's what. So I'd like to just to, to take a little sidestep here and just talk about drinking, talk about alcohol in our society. Uh, let's see it, the first slide here and, and ask that question. Are there risks to, to the fetus to social drinking? Well, if I had you in front of me, which is a much more comfortable format for Julie and I, we would them. definitely ask you that question. And hopefully you would say yes, because again, three ounces of alcohol in one week is not a lot of alcohol. That would absolutely be considered social drinking. One glass of wine with a meal on Wednesday, one glass on Friday, one on Monday can cause some sort of damage. Why are we concerned with even a small amount of alcohol consumed during social drinking. Also, the other thing is social drink. What does that what mean? What is social drinking? What, what, exactly. To an alcoholic, social yeah. drinking can mean a six-pack. I remember when I worked with the youth program, I found one of the boys had gone off the wagon over the weekend. Of course, the kids tell you everything. And when I talked to him about it, he said, I just had one beer. Well, it was a 40 answer. To another fellow, one beer was a case. So again, when we think about doctors talking to pregnant women and saying, oh, if you're stressed out, you know, have a glass of beer in the evening. What is a glass of beer? Is that glass of beer something you're pouring out of that 40 ouncer? Is a glass of wine uh, the end of the bottle when you have topped off the top for the 10th time? Right. You know, what is and, safe drinking? And even if you're not drinking alcoholically, if we asked all of you what your definition of social drinking is, I bet you we'd get different answers from every one of you. Some people would think that it was, you know, two drinks a night. Some think would, you know, just on Fridays, only if you went to parties. I mean, there are lots of definitions. Um, about what social drinking is, whether even if you're not drinking alcoholically. Absolutely. I mean, and even thinking about one drink of, uh, say someone is a gin drinker, and, and they're told it's okay to have a drink. Well, is a drink pouring uh, a gin into an eight-ounce glass and hitting it with a splash of squirt? Right. <laughs> or is it, you know, a shot of gin and the rest mixer? Okay, let's see the next slide. So what are we, again, why are we worrying about social drinking? Well, in a newborn, these are very serious things. And before, miscarriage is very serious. Stillbirth is serious. Low birth weight and the behavior problems we see, even from small amounts of alcohol, it's, just, it's not worth it. Next uh, slide, please. Now, in looking at a newborn, and I think Julie alluded to some of this earlier, these are some of the behaviors you might see in a newborn. And it's harder to see behavior in a newborn. The brain has not developed enough to give us a higher functioning, brain functioning, and different behaviors that would tell us whether or not this child was tracking. But poor, the poor suck reflex, irregular sleep patterns, delayed development, all these things. And I was looking at that list one day and thinking, gee, if I thought about this in terms of an adult, someone who had trouble eating and didn't sleep well, wasn't tracking, had uh, balance problems, attention problems. You know, that's the state we're in when we're drinking. You know, the, our children are sort of that's walking right. around in a state of inebriation. Next slide, please. A lot of women have said, you know, I didn't drink during pregnancy, and they meant it. And there are several reasons. We've touched on a lot of them. One could be that they think that wine coolers is 
is not drinking. That's not alcohol. Or a glass of wine is not alcohol. That only hardcore alcohol out of the bottle is alcohol. Well, alcohol is alcohol is alcohol. It doesn't matter if it's in your wine cooler, in your gin bottle, in your beer, uh, whatever. Alcohol is alcohol. And it is the alcohol that is the thing that is dangerous. It doesn't matter if it's dressed up in a fancy bottle with a big price tag. So it doesn't matter that you've had celebrated getting pregnant with that Dom Perignon or Mad Dog 2020. It is alcohol that's going to cause the damage to the fetus. Uh, also, women say they didn't drink because they were told by the doctor to, so it's not drinking, it's, it's medication. It's a prescription. Yes, and of course, denial. That's right. That's the biggest. And the other thing, the, one of the big things, too, is, you know, what's pregnancy? I mean, we've asked you what's, what is social drinking, and I know that we could come up with different answers, but we could ask you, too, what is pregnancy? And is it from the time of conception to delivery, or is it the time of from knowledge to delivery? Mm -hmm. And there is a window there in that early part of pregnancy um, that women do not know that they are pregnant. And so if you ask somebody, did you drink during pregnancy, and if it was before they actually knew that they were pregnant, they may say no That's and right. believe that. And remember the peace sign. That's right. <laughs> the first two months are critical, so of course, uh, it's very dangerous to drink during that time when you're when you don't even know whether you're pregnant or not. Next slide, please. So you know if we have this information about fetal alcohol syndrome, the the Surgeon General is even warning us on labels that it is very dangerous to drink during pregnancy. Uh, next slide, please. And you know why are we still drinking? Well, because it is the number one drug of choice in America. People have told us that they celebrate everything with alcohol, including knowledge of pregnancy. I found out I was pregnant and we went out and bought a really great bottle of champagne. Um, unfortunately, it is not uncommon to find in birthing material, and I did find this in a friend's Lamaze literature, what to bring to the birth. Bring a car seat, bring blankets, diapers, etc., etc. And it said, and if you would like to celebrate the birth of your child, bring a couple of glasses and a bottle of champagne and we'll be happy to chill it for you. Then under that it said, and by the way, breastfeed for a year is very healthy for the baby. Yeah. So these are confusing, confusing, confusing messages. Message. Very confusing. Next slide, please. Well, of course, the liquor industry is not helping us, are they? They're, they have their head in the sand sometimes. I, can't, I shouldn't say that on television because the liquor industry is trying to help us uh, in different ways, but not, not enough. And that was a real ad. I, we didn't make that up. I was looking at it and trying to figure out what is the message. If I drink enough doers, I, I'm, I don't have to be afraid of anything. And I looked at that and thought, you know, I'm not sure I want to be in that position exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Sorry. Okay, next slide, please. The other thing that is very upsetting to me is uh, how they're advertising to younger and younger audiences. Now, I wish I had a slide that showed the uh, Budweiser frog ads because, you know, those ads, even though the train ad and the, and the Bud Frog ad don't tell our children to drink, they are, they are grooming the next generation of consumer. They're making it friendly and fun to have alcohol in your life. And I was shocked at uh, how I helped to raise a child who's now nine. And when he was only three or four, we had people for Christmas dinner. We never really had alcohol in the house. And somebody brought a bottle of wine. We got wine glasses out. And he wanted his grape juice, which he normally didn't drink grape juice, but he wanted grape juice, obviously the color of red wine, in a wine glass to be one of us. And that was very upsetting to me when I realized how he, we were modeling, even this once a year situation, modeling behavior for him. And the health department has a great poster of a little boy reaching up into a fairly empty refrigerator for a beer on the top shelf. And it says, don't let your child's first uh, beer be yours. And that doesn't mean that that child was going to drink it, but having him bring the beer to you while you're watching TV in the living room. Don't allow them to even put their hands on alcohol. We have to let our children know, and especially if they come from alcoholic parents, that they really can't afford to have that first drink. One alcoholic parent, I think you have about a 45% chance of being alcoholic. Two alcoholic parents, an 85% chance of being alcoholic. So it's a real setup, and especially for our affected kids. Right. When you think of them having that in their genetics, as well as uh, the impulse control problems, not connecting action and consequence,
memory deficit? Are they going to remember the lectures and so forth? You know, they really are in line to become drinkers themselves. And it's important to start that alcohol, the education about alcoholism early, you know, with our children. And, you know, it's okay to be concrete in our, you know, our messages to our young children who are alcohol affected. I mean, Brandon comes to us, they had just had a little health um, seminar at school in kindergarten, actually, and he had come home and he was talking about, you know, the dangers of smoking cigarettes and doing drugs and drinking and all of that, and he says, that's against the law, huh, Mom? He says, I'll get unarrested if I drink, won't I? I said, that's right, Brandon, you will be unarrested if you drink. Now, you know, he's almost six, and if he wants to think that he's going to be unarrested at that point, I'm going to, I'll, I'll keep that myth going, because it's dangerous for him. Yeah, it's, it's not dangerous. safe. Yeah, I know when I worked with uh, street youth, I told them, you know, more than likely one, your first drink will be the beginning of a life of alcoholism for you. There is no safe amount. Uh, uh, let's see the next slide, please. Now, you know, you can do a great job of raising your children. You can teach them everything they need to know about being a good person, having good values, uh, doing the right thing, making the right choices. And this, of course, is assuming that their brains are wired correctly so that they can make those choices. But you get them, especially after puberty, with their peers, and you are no longer the center of their universe. And I always say, if there's anyone out there who feels that they are the center of their teenager's universe, I will personally pay for your counseling because you are not really uh, living in reality. It is very difficult to be a teenager these days. I think at any point in time it's been difficult because our peers have always influenced us greatly. But now there is so much, uh, there is so much exposure at such an early age. Elementary school kids saying almost to a person that they've had exposure to alcohol or drugs by someone coming up to them at school or something and children uh, having alcohol in their homes and being able to have that. So, you know, there is no guarantee that even if you've done such a great job raising your child that they won't be pressured into drinking. So we've got to, you know, keep that connection, stay connected to our kids, communicate with them, be involved in family activities, and learn about out the signs of alcohol. You know, one mother told me, that she found out her, her daughter, who was a leader in school, had put on a citywide drug and alcohol prevention teen program, all kinds of things, found out she had started binge drinking because she was pressured at parties to drink and kids were teasing her that she didn't join in. And she found out that she was a binge drinker and thought that those Sundays that she would come home from her girlfriends and sleep all day was just because she was a teenager. And in fact, she was uh, suffering from a hangover. And when we think about, I mean, especially in my house, I mean, I, I'll admit to you, I am not above artificially modifying my children's peer groups. And if it means as they get, you know, hit adolescence or whatever, that I might have to rent a friend or, you know, <laughs> modify the circle of friends that they are with, I will do that because uh -huh. the biggest thing for me is to keep my children safe. Great. So let's talk about how advertising is focused on women of childbearing age. And uh, I'm sure that you've seen Cosmo magazine. Well, this is not an ad you'll find in Cosmo. Cosmo paid a lot of money to put this ad in a liquor industry magazine. Now, the liquor industry has magazines. Why? They are not going to go spend thousands of dollars putting ads in Cosmo unless they know it's going to pay off. So Cosmo paid thousands of dollars to put this ad in the liquor industry magazine, and they're trying to attract the liquor industry into Cosmopolitan by saying, hey, last week our readers drank 21,794 glasses of beer, and then below that they list the millions of glasses of wine and wine coolers and all that that people had during the last months. And then cutely enough at the bottom it says, isn't it time you give Cosmo a shot? Well, who? look at that picture. Who is the target? Young women of childbearing age. Now, the next slide, and the one that you uh, just have seen, is going to show you, again, how advertising is trying to pull us in to the myth that alcohol is connected to being beautiful, it's connected to being young, it's connected to having money, it's connected to having friends and fun and all kinds of things. And I always say, you know, if I really thought that a case of Budweiser would get me into that bathing suit, I might just leave Julie right here and walk across to the store no, I've got her and beat. buy a no. couple of cases. <laughs> 
I mean, I have 20, I'm, another hat I wear is I am a recovering alcoholic, and I have over 21 years of sobriety. And, you know, I'm 47 years old, I'm pretty intelligent, I've been around the block a time or two, and, but I think about, you know, the impact that those kinds of media and messages have on us, and I agree with Carolyn. I mean, if somebody really could guarantee to me that a six-pack of Budweiser a night could put me in a bathing suit and I would look like that, you know, I would be maybe seriously tempted to leave here. But, and it is, I mean, this is dangerous. These are dangerous messages for our young yes, people. It is. Years ago, they had a great series on late night TV when teenagers might be watching of myth and reality, it was called. And it had ads like that, like the Miller ads, everyone cheering together, having a great time. Everybody looked healthy, looked wealthy, etc. Then it flipped to a scene at a party, someone being sick in the corner, somebody starting a fight, somebody being, uh, you know, kind of pawed at by somebody, you know, police arriving, the whole thing. And unfortunately, they didn't last long, but I thought they were very powerful. And that's what we have to do for our children. Tell them the truth. You know, when I work with kids around alcohol issues, the first thing I say to them is, you know what? People drink because it's fun. Yeah. Tell them the truth. That's the truth. You know, then you can start talking to them about the other uh, realities, but we do need to be truthful with our kids, and and then we need to teach them coping skills because they start drinking because they can't cope. When they don't have co proper coping skills, they will go to whatever they've seen if they've been raised around alcohol, or the peers will pull them into it. And if we're talking about reality, the next slide, I think, you know, if we're <laughs> going to talk about fantasy versus fact. The next picture here is, if I remember back to 21 plus years ago when I did drink, this is what I truly looked like. It certainly wasn't the girl in the Budweiser bathing suit. <laughs> but you know, people tell me, yes, indeed, that when they were drinking, they did think they looked That's, like that girl yeah, in the Budweiser yeah. ad, but in fact, they didn't. But actually, you know, women get a bad rap around alcohol. Uh, we only have half the enzyme in our body to metabolize alcohol that men do. So truly, ladies, we are kind of cheap drunks. And also, we have a bad reputation around alcohol. If all of the women that were here in the studio went out for one drink after this broadcast, and we did that every Tuesday night for a month, we would have a reputation. That's right. You know, the fellas can go out almost nightly even, and it's just a night out with the boys and who's counting the drinks. <laughs> I'm, and if there are men out there, thank you for coming. I do appreciate you. I do need you to help us raise our children, but help our women as well. Again, I want to emphasize that women do not drink to harm their unborn children. And the next slide is a dear friend, uh, Linda Lefevre, who is such a fabulous advocate in the field of fetal alcohol syndrome, and her son, Danny, who's now 19. Uh, and this was taken shortly after the diagnosis. And he, I want you to know, has graduated from high school. He has five or six or seven gold, Special Olympic gold medals, mm -hmm. and is doing well because his mother has held him dear. His mother has created a safe, structured environment for him. But she has gone through it, and she has written a book called Cheers, Here's to the Baby that uh, really talks about this whole episode of drinking and the resulting uh, fact that she had a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. So she talked about finding out about this diagnosis, going into denial immediately afterwards, and then realizing that she was going to have to be there for her son for the rest of her life, and has, as I said, been an advocate and is part of the Family Research Institute out there. If you get fast times, if not, you should, because that is a, a newsletter specifically aimed at parents that will talk to you about uh, research that's in the field right now, as well as behaviors and interventions and so forth. But she talks in the next slide, these are Linda's slides that are coming up, she talks about what it was like for her to get sober and, and what it was about for her drinking. And she said, you know, it wasn't about emptying the bottle. It was about trying to fill up all the holes. And the holes were loneliness and sorrow and fear and uh, se uh, self-esteem issues and shame and all kinds of things. Women do seem, in I think many cases, to drink for different reasons than men do. And they get sober for different reasons. M women tend to get sober more often around their family issues, to get their children back or save their marriage, uh, than oftentimes many men you'll talk to them and it'll be more conversation about losing their job or their home. And, and I mean, obviously, of course, losing their family and they're attached to that too. So she decided to get sober and she was very excited about that and was looking forward to sobriety. And this next slide 
is also her rendition of what her life of getting sober was going to be like. It was going to be like falling into a sea of daisies. The next slide was her realization of the reality. She said it was like falling into a sea of sharks. And there is the list of uh, the things that probably drove her into drinking in the first place. I mean, the kids are there, the laundry, the bills, the dishes, and probably all that was exacerbated by the fact that, that uh, you know, she had been drinking and maybe not dealing with all of these issues as well as she could have. And they're always still there. Go ahead, the next slide. She talks a lot about, you know, the prison of guilt and shame. And think about that. Just alcohol issues for women create a prison of guilt and shame for them. But if you end up having a child who has been affected by your drinking, the, the devastation is incredible. We've had some women come into clinic with their birth children who had about two or three years of sobriety behind them who just couldn't take the reality of the diagnosis, thought they were prepared for it, but really weren't. It takes a very brave woman to come in with her child to clinic and to hear this news and then and then continue on in sobriety and continue being there for that child and being that, that structure. And really those keys are inside of her. And many times... How to get those keys to unlock that gate is through motherhood, that they recognize, like Linda did, how important it was for her to be in her child's life. So she said in the next slide that, you know, there was light at the end of the tunnel um, and there was a way out. But you know what? That light shines on reality. And in the next picture, you'll see what the reality for Linda was at the time. This is a picture of Danny when he was five or six. And, you know, this was kind of, he's 19 now, so this was kind of the format of pictures back then. The photographer didn't know Danny or anything about him. She looks at this picture even today when she lectures and cries because she says this is the agony of fetal alcohol syndrome. The bottom picture is Danny seeing a bunch of kids out on the playground. He runs out there. He wants to find out, um, you know, what's going on. And quickly he's on the sideline. Now, If any of you have figured out the answer to our question about will mom have that baby if she uh, drinks around the 19th day, this would be a good time to call in. And and also, why do you think that picture of Danny, the top picture, was sad? What Tell us, what do you think happened when he saw those kids out on the field, ran out there to join in, and was on the sidelines? Within a very short period of time. Within a very short period of time. So we're waiting for input here. Uh, If anybody wants to email us, we'll be happy to answer questions, uh, happy to take online calls, answer anything you want to know. And we're waiting for those answers to our, our little story. Mom drinks a lot, gets to day 18 in the pregnancy, stops drinking, starts drinking day 25 until the end of the pregnancy. Will her child be diagnosed possibly with fetal alcohol syndrome. Anybody out there want to venture a guess? Not yet. Well, time's going to force us to tell you the answer. That's right. I think you all know that, too. You know that if you hang out there long enough, we'll have to tell you the answer to our questions. Go the ahead. answer actually is no. Um, the chances of that child having the full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome, um, especially if I think we had a couple of different scenarios going, but and I had kind of said if she didn't drink at all until the 15th week of pregnancy. But even if she is a binge drinker and for some reason wasn't feeling well, was in detox, her pattern of drinking was only to drink on Friday and Saturday nights, and so she didn't drink, you know, Sunday through Thursdays, and she happened to miss that night, that window of the 19th through the 23rd day. Chances are that your, that baby will not have this set of facial anomalies. Now the eyes may be a little bit small. Um, There will definitely be um, a great risk for growth deficiency because she's drinking through the end of her pregnancy. There will be definitely a great risk of um, central nervous system damage because remember the brain doesn't stop developing even at the time of delivery. Our brains are continuing to develop all through our lives but especially through our you know early childhood and up until about 20 or so. But the child will not have all of the facial characteristics that are part of the diagnostic criteria to have the full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome. 
Now the reason that Carolyn and I actually both stress this so much in our trainings is because there have been many situations, many times, that we will give um, a caregiver or a social worker or whatever, we'll give that child um, tell them that the diagnosis for their child is not full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome. Perhaps it would be neurobehavioral disorder or static encephalopathy, which is just a big fancy word for brain damage. But they don't have all of the facial features. And we've both heard the caregivers or the caseworkers or whatever walking down the hallway on their way out the door and they're going, oh man, honey, I am so glad. I don't know about you, but I am so relieved that he does not have fetal alcohol syndrome, that all he has is neurobehavioral disorder or the old term, FAE rather than FAS. Fetal alcohol syndrome is not a more severe case of FAE. You know, Truly, my kids, like I've said before, my kids are not on IEPs at school because they have short palpebral fissures or because they're very tiny for size. They are on IEPs at school because their brains are different. Mm -hmm. So so we want you to call in 1-800-407-9487 and at least take a shot at uh, what we talked about with Danny's picture. Can we have that back up on the screen? Again, here is Danny at the bottom. He sees a bunch of kids on the playground, very excitedly runs out to join them and is in a short period of time back on the sidelines alone and not such a happy camper. Don't hear any phones yet. Well, let's go to let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about the answer. You know, Danny's MRI is on the right, and I know it's a little hard on the screen to tell, but his head is much smaller than the uh, person on the left who's exactly his same age at the time that they took this MRI. He has much less brain mass. You can see that there are holes in the brain. So when he goes out there and they tell him who his teammates are, he hears that information. How does it get processed? Does it get to where it should, where he can categorize information and understand that that person, that person, that person are on his team, or all the red t-shirts are his team and the blue are not. No, it falls through those holes. You know, it can possibly come to a part of the brain that is not functioning either at all or at the moment is quirky. So he can do things like uh, go the wrong direction on the field, take the ball from the wrong person, not give it back, improper body boundaries. There are many, many, many things that can happen to cause him to be the kid who's out there on the sidelines. And when he's on the sidelines, who might he run into out there? He might run into people who can get him in trouble. And our children love people, trust people, will go off with anybody. I'll, I'll end this session with just a quick story about a fellow with 107 IQ, trusted to catch the bus home from high school and get home a half an hour before mom and dad. One day he missed the bus. They got home a little later than usual even, and he was home. It was fine. But there was no TV no stereo, several things missing. And when they said to him, where are our things? He said, Fred took them. Well, who's Fred? Well, Fred is my friend. Where did you meet Fred? At the bus stop. When? Today. So that, and it could be that this person, Fred, said, gee, nice TV, or I see you have two or something. And this fellow could have even offered up uh, these um, uh, expensive pieces of equipment. So the brain damage can lead to all kinds of problems in life, uh, even if this child, like Danny, doesn't really exhibit a lot of real behavior problems. But just because of lack of ju judgment and different things that he's dealing with, he, without being held the way he has been by his mother and friends and people in his community, is possibly one of Dr. Streisky's statistics as an adult, someone who is more than likely incarcerated, homeless, and again, uh, looking at those higher rates of suicide. So we'll come back in 10 minutes and take more calls if we have them, emails, and we're also going to preview a movie. Thank you very much. <laughs>